most people, myself included, when I started out, the best thing was like listening to the senior worker in the cubicle. And that's absolutely not the guy to listen to for financial advice. Yeah, finding your peer group of pure passive accredited investors doing this stuff. And that's when you're going to find these little tips like this. This is a and try to rent them out and then he became one hey simple passive castle listeners today we have bill smith here who is going to tell us all about the do-it-yourself cost segregation for those of you guys who own single family homes or rental properties on your own this can be a great cost effective means for doing a cost segregation but i guess bill help me let's start at the top no investor left behind what is a cost segregation before we start drilling into this do-it-yourself one? Okay, essentially a cost segregation study, a real estate asset, mostly residential, what you're dealing with is 27 and a half years or 39 years. And so that's your straight line depreciation. You can take that deduction every year to reduce your tax liability. What cost segregation does is we break down a building, essentially dissect it into its component parts like when you were in eighth grade and you were in biology to dis dissect a frog and take everything out, all those parts, we put a different life to them. So those parts have a different life. And by short lifing those certain components that the IRS allows, you get greater deductions up front, realizing the time value of money, and then you can invest in more properties. So essentially that's what we do is dissect a building, assign a new life, you know, they call it reclassify that property and then you have higher deductions in earlier years. Very elegantly said. And if you guys want to learn more about cost segregation, go and check out podcast 137. We did a little bit more deeper dive into the topic and I have a master cost segregation guide. If you are more of a read it and on your free time type of person, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash cost seg. And while you're on the page, you can also put in your email and sign up for the newsletter to get the free goodie there, which is the K-1 tracker form for those syndication investors who have all these K-1s all over the place and keeping track of your deductions, which you get those deductions by doing these cost segregations. And on some of the larger deals, I'm seeing like almost 50 to 80% come back of what they invest as first year depreciation. But that's all fine and dandy on the big deals, the syndication deals. But what we're talking today is this cost-effective do-it-yourself one that really makes it worthwhile to do it on a smaller property. When I do it on my apartments, Bill and I were looking at this last deal and we were going to cost-seg it out. We don't know the, the exact price yet, but it's in the range of what, four to $6,000 typically on a large building. And on a smaller building, it can be, you've got to send the guy out there and there's a lot of modeling. But there's another way of doing it. And maybe, Bill, if you could go through that, what we're talking about today, the, the pared down version. Yeah. So DIY Cost Seg is a platform we developed after being in the industry since 2002 and doing well over 15,000 studies. And we saw a need in the market for smaller properties under a million dollars. And whether it's a single family residential, duplex, quad, or triplex, we cover those or it might also be a dentist office or any other kind of commercial property under a million. We actually go up to $3 million, but it's a lower cost, quicker alternative. And so how that works is we've built a modeling system and we'll model the property. So it's a non-inspection product. It takes essentially five or 10 minutes to input the data. You put in your credit card and you get your results instantly. So what happens with that is you're done and you get your results. So it is gonna air conservative. And because we're not inspecting it, there's been a lot of talk like on bigger pockets. Maybe your folks listen to bigger pockets about these solutions. We have tremendous supporters and people that question it, mostly competitors, but we provide auto protection. So in the event you're audited, which is very rare, but if you are audited, we are going to send an engineer out there and do a full engineered study, which we do. Again, we've done well over 15,000 a year to, since 2002. So we will defend you fully so you're protected. But it's a quick and easy solution, whether it's a one to four family, with the discount code that you've got through here with Lane, it is uh, $640. That's a one to four. It doesn't matter what's a single family or a quad, anything in between. And if it's under a million dollars and five plus units, it's $1,390. And $1 that includes the auto protections, $195. It's insurance policy. So basically, it works great. It's a good solution for the right situation. Certainly, there are plenty of properties that are under a million or right in that borderline that justify the full asset detail, 
that you'd get from a cost segregation study for a future abandonment and disposition and things. So depending on your purpose with the property and what your plans are with it, I talk to folks and say, this is your best option or this is your best option. Are you looking to maximize your depreciation and do a lot of value add, or are you just looking for quick deductions and, and an answer here? If you're a real estate professional or not, sometimes that makes a difference. How valuable are these tax deductions to you for an right, and, it, and it also takes into account like how long are you going to hold on to the property? If it's just like a turnkey rental that you're going to dump in three years to go to syndication deals, maybe it doesn't make sense. But if you're costing out maybe a little bit larger property, especially in California, uh, maybe that might be just enough to get some tax savings to uh, save up more money and, and eventually go into deals and get cost segregations there and then sell the properties and not have to do a 1031 exchange, which I don't like at all. But you guys can go to, again, simplepassatcashflow.com slash cost say, and then there's the link there with the discount code SPC. But I really wanted to dive into, there's some controversy with this stuff. Well, yeah, let's, so let's speak to it. Let's have a mature conversation about the risks of what they are and some of the cons. Okay, so you're asking what the cons are. The cons are you have to have, have a tax liability and you have to be able to use the benefits. I talk to people that say, okay, I want to get this. I heard about this depreciation. I want a bonus and I want everything. It's like, well, are you a real estate professional? Well, no, you, you got a W-2 job. Yes, you got, they don't have that much income where potentially straight line can almost neutralize their needs. They have to actually need it and have deductions because they are passive. Of course, if it's a business property and not residential or it's Airbnb, I talked to a guy the other day who's calling about this. He's doing Airbnb. He was like, put this on my schedule C. And I'm like, yeah, you could because it's a 39-year commercial property based on your tax situation. That's a discussion with your CPA. So he was looking at getting these deductions on a Schedule C, which actually did make some sense. But again, we're not CPAs. We don't give that advice. So I talk to folks, what makes sense for you? What's your tax need? And is this the right thing to do? And anything from $58,000 single family we did the other day with a guy in upstate New York to we just did a $120 million building in Atlanta, which obviously is a full cost cycle. Yeah. Oh, I'm not a CPA, but I'll walk people through the quick math in their heads. So Basically, we all know that on the residential property, you're able to deduct 127 the building value every year. So on a $100,000 property, let's just assume that half of that property value is the building value. But in a lot of places that we like to invest in the Midwest and South with lower land values, that probably two thirds of it. But let's just go at $50,000 and $100,000 purchase price. Now you divide that by 27. So 50,000 divided by 27, you're roughly talking about a couple grand a year of deductions, which is great. But when you do a cost segregation, the general rule is you're looking about a third of the building value in the first year via cost segregation using utilizing bonus depreciation. So one third of that building value, 50,000. So you're looking at 18, something like that. Yeah, so 18 grand compared to about two grand. So maybe a little bit less than 10 times the amount of deductions you withdraw out in that first year. That is. But, but I, I think in the market you're talking about, you're giving a lot of value to land because you live in Hawaii. 10. And usually in the CPA like Brandon Hall, he always wants to use the assessed value. And if the assessed value is below 20%, you go with the assessed value. If it's not, you look at the 20%. It's the rule a lot of people use. I've got people that use 10% on pretty aggressive properties. Now we have to be able to support that. So we're, if it's a problem, we're gonna say, wait, we can't justify that land value for you, but usually 20%. So on a hundred thousand deal, you're looking at 80,000. Let's say it was 20%, just at a conservative number for a house. That's a $20,000 deduction in year one with bonus depreciation. And that goes to the end of 2022, unless the new administration happens to change that. We don't know if they would or can. And and how quick that would actually happen. But it won't happen on January 23rd. We know that. I've got a couple more years to think <laughs> and, and employ this strategy. But it's ultimately, it sounds great, right? You're getting 10 to 15 times more deductions the first year, but there's a cost to this. And when I do it for my large apartment buildings, I'm usually paying five grand or so on that thing to do this, to extract it out. But that requires sending out a guy on expenses to travel out there. That's obviously not cost effective to spend $5,000 to get $20,000 of deductions at 25% tax bracket. That's a break even. So that's where this do it yourself cost segregation product comes in. But 
Bill, let me put you on the spot here. Why would Lane spend $5,000? What else am I getting in my cost seg that somebody spending 600 bucks on one of these things isn't getting? Just sitting, so no eyes wide open what they're going into. Well, there's a huge difference. And, and I think on your bigger deals, if you're spending 5,000, you're not getting a very good study. You need to spend more than 5,000. They're usually between five and 10. So on an apartment complex, it might be 7,500. Six, six to eight, depending again on the engineering that's done. So on a full study, we look at it. And I think anybody else would look at what are the engineering hours it's going to take to do the work? Because we send somebody on site, we count everything, we qualify everything and we do all the asset detail. So in a full study, you get complete asset detail, meaning all your roof detail, all your HVAC detail, all your straight line detail, as well as all your short life detail, carpeting, flooring, cabinets, everything you've got. And we give a hundred page report back to you showing out all that detail. And we go into everything, electrical breakers, no one else gets the breakers. We do things that people don't do. So we, we engineer deeper, but everybody goes in and engineers pretty deep and gets all the outlets and things. So that's what a full study is. It's a lot of pages. It's a lot of research and a lot of documentation. It, which, it's a guy on site too. Uh, oh yeah. You always see a guy on site. Yeah. Uh, you always send a guy on site, an engineer. We send our own engineers. Some people would send picture takers and interviewers and stuff, but somebody always goes on site. That's pretty much what happens. Now with DIY, it's a non-inspection product. So DIY means we're modeling. So we're going to err conservative. So if we would have gotten 25% uh, results by going on site, we might get 19% by the DIY because we're not sending somebody on site. If in fact you're audited though, again, as I mentioned, we will go send somebody on site and we will do that hundred page report for you. But what you're going to get with DIY is a model solution, which is what a lot of the people out there do models and residuals and sampling, and they add pictures and some engineering. But what you get is a one page report that gives you your five, seven, 15 and 27 and a half year. And then some categories of generally what it would be. And then a receipt, and then your data inputs, because some people input the data wrong. We fix it for them. We don't charge you for you that. You get a very streamlined report, but that's all the CPA cares about. CPA cares about 100 pages. They want 5, 7, 15, and 27 and a half to put on your tax return, and they're done. So that's what DIY does. So it gives you a lower number. It's a lot less expensive. And so that's why it's good for the lower value properties where maybe you can't justify a five or $10,000 study or for that. And then we also have a hybrid. So one of the things to think about, which I did, we did a million two house in South like Hawaii, but that'd be a small house in Hawaii in LA this year. We did a desktop. So a desktop takes our fully engineered study methodology. We use an engineer, but we don't inspect. We ask the homeowner for answer a few questions, maybe get us a few more pictures because the appraisals usually don't have good property pictures. If they have a listing, like this was an Airbnb, a listing, then we had a lot of great pictures. Had a swimming pool and tree, amazing, great, great landscape, good view. We got 52% of the property value for her. She was blown away. She was like, wow. Now that's not, doesn't happen all the time, but that one, if she'd been just a little bit under it, it might've done a DIY, would not get near that because we just don't know all these specialty palm trees and swimming pool and hot tub and the things that it says pool, so we'll do the valuations, but it was, and that's going to be a lower cost product, about halfway between the DIY and the full study. But so on, on a big house like that, they're usually in, in the three to $4,000 range, but you're going to get a full study, fully defendable, and you get a lot of detail. And, and that's the, the thing. When you do one of these studies, if you were to do one, I would really suggest you guys get the audit protection. So how does that kick in? I think there's a pretty low chance of getting audited if you were. I don't know if the, like the percent chance, but I think it's pretty dang low. It's very low. Of, of all the tax returns that get audited, 4% of all returns get pulled for audit, which is a low number, four or five. And cost segregation, depreciation does not trigger an audit. We've got over 15,000 studies. We've done plenty of audits, but relatively speaking, very few. But cost segregation has never been the trigger for the audit. People have gotten audited for something else. And when they get an audit, of course, they look at everything. They come in there and look at everything. So then they go in and depreciation schedules on the trick. So they, they say, okay, we need to check out why you did this or whatever. We send the report. If they ask a specific question, we answer their question. We show them the documentation, send the report. And the auditor is happy because there's somebody out of college working for PwC or something. And they go, check. And they're off to the next thing. They got a list of 30 or 40 things. So 
There have you. Our report is bulletproof and we've helped defend people that have been audited. They've done it themselves. They got in trouble. We've gone and defended them. One guy was in audit for two years. We did a quick study. We did a 27 page engineering letter, like a study summary. They sent it to the IRS in two days. They closed this case. He had three more plants and was building a, a fifth plant. And so we, we got a client for life out of that. Yeah. Audits, but they're rare. You want to anticipate the worst and, and expect the best. Yeah, so so I'm running through out. this, like I get the cost seg, right? Pay 500 bucks or so. Use my code to get a little off of that. And maybe that helps pay for half of the audit protection and another hundred bucks. Like a couple of years go by in the audit, maybe something else gets flagged in my tax return and they start digging into this. What, what do I do with them? Like, all right, email bill and say, all right, man, the audit protection thing I bought. What, what's the steps at that point? You guys are like, all right, man, we got it. We're going to send the guy out. And what's yeah. the timeline and what are the steps? So what's going to happen if, if, in the event there's an audit, your CPO will get involved. They'll call us and say, hey, we've got an audit. And, and they're looking into the depreciation schedule. We say, yes, this one will not support an audit. So we will then send somebody out on site, do the study, get it back and defend it. And they'll usually have a specific question. So we might be able to defend it and just answer those specific questions. But if we need to go out and do a full study, well, and if we go do a full study, we're going to find five, 10% plus more. So you're going to make some, oh, thanks for auditing. Cause we actually have another $25,000 in depreciation we didn't claim. So we're going to do a uh, 3115 change of accounting method and we're going to get this and actually you owe us a refund. It may not go like that. That'd be a really happy ending, but we will find a lot more detail and we will get more benefit for you. So there's no chance there's going to be any problems. Yeah. I think the do it yourself model is pretty dang close anyway. It might be so negligible that it may not even matter, but I don't know if that's true. If, if you do get audited and they do blow things up and you do find that your cost seg comes back even stronger that you go back and refile it. It seems like you should, right? Maybe just wait till the, the, the dust settles and, and refile next year so you don't piss off that particular auditor, right? They forget that they're, they're not that tough. But if you've done it in the year you purchased it, so you've already done component level depreciation. So actually you can't go and do another 3115 change of accounting method on the same thing you've already done. I had someone ask me if they could reverse it because now they're real estate professional two years later go back to straight line for two years and then do a 31. I said, no, you can't. That's well, and, there's and a lot if, of tax. So I had to go to the CPA on that one. So. And what if they didn't pay for that insurance, a hundred bucks insurance, how, how much legal fees or CPA fees does that take to defend something like that? It just takes us going out and doing a study or getting a study. You just have to go out and pay that $5,000 for a study. So you have to defend that. So I mean, it'll be certainly defendable. There's no issue. It's not going to be wrong. You just have to give them the detail. And that's what the one big audit we did for that plan. He did it. He was basically right. The CEO, when they were doing rubber for Nike and a whole bunch of stuff, he, he was basically right, but he didn't have the backup details. The IRS wants you to detail out what you did. And that's where our study with our traditional study has straight line components completely broken out. No one else does that unless you pay for an asset detail report. And they'll charge again another five or six grand on top of that original five or six grand they charged. And so, okay, now you're looking at 12 grand when we could have ELB for maybe seven for a thousand more and you're looking at, cause we do the detail on everything. And what happens when you have that is you get disposition abandonment, which creates expense. So expense is great. So what you're not going to get from, let's say you're doing roofs and things. So you get a roof, we put a value on it for, if it's about to be changed I and mean, we're not going to high value it because it looks like it needs to be, it's not, you know, 30 year roof. We might have twenty, thirty thousand dollars valued on the roof, say on an apartment complex, like on one of the, one of your bigger projects, or even on a house. Houses that we do DIY. So what happens? Guys up there in the shingles, they rip off the shingles from the dumpster, they haul them away to the landfill, and then boom, throw them away. And you put on a new two hundred thousand dollar roof. On residential, you can't expense it. On commercial, you can expense it. Expenses are always better than depreciation. But what happens? You had twenty thousand dollars worth of value on that roof, you just threw it away. And so at a thirty-three percent tax bracket. That is $6,600 you just threw away. If you don't have the asset detail and don't know how to dispose of it or retire that asset that you're replacing on the straight line, which is actually a requirement from the IRS and their TPRs, tangible property regs from 2014. So that's why asset detail is important when you're going to be doing a lot of repairs and maintenance, especially the straight line. It's also important for the short life property, but now since 100% bonus is in place, Anything that's five-year property, carpeting, things you're replacing, once you've done 100% bonus, it's already written off. You've disposed of it. It's off your books. 
And so you just basically put in five years. So you spent 10,000 on flooring, you put 10,000 in five year life flooring. So and we help our clients identify life components when they do replacements. Yeah, and, and the form is pretty dummy proof. It's pretty easy. I mean, you can do it in five minutes when <laughs> I was looking at it. But yeah, so when people, they, are you guys, this insurance, are you guys self-insuring it? It's not through a third party. We're self-insuring. Okay, okay. So you guys, yeah, you, I'm sure you guys stand behind that percent chance of audit because you guys are the one owning up if it's not yeah. higher than that, right? Yeah. That's that's why people always ask, oh, do you think this deal is good? Look, man, I'm putting in my money. That's what I think. And in this way, you guys are like self-insuring these audits. And if not, you guys are going to do the work we are charged with this kind of insurance policy that you guys have in place. Yeah. So the odds are very low and we're going to be air on conservative. So you're not going to get maximum benefit, but you're going to get good benefits. And you're going to get actually very similar to what some of our competitors do because they use a modeling solution. They blend a little bit of engineering. We've actually done some tests and comparisons. We actually go up to 3 million now on that. And it goes up. It's not 640. That's just for a house, but it goes up to close to 3,000, I think, for a higher property. And we also then, we do some, we do them on multiple mobile home parks. Those we almost manually do. Our guy behind the curtain, he works on those. DIY is a great solution. It's been really well adopted. A lot of folks in bigger pockets are big fans. A lot of folks, a lot of CPAs that use it for their smaller clients that have investors. I get a lot of calls. And I get calls all the time. People go onto our website going, hey, I've got this house. Let me know. And so we've got a number of big CPAs that also refer us when they have a smaller client. I talk to them and I set it up and they got 10 houses or I got one, got a guy that has 10 houses. We did on Thursday, we connected and did 10 houses last Thursday. All right. So yeah, to, to close things out, this why is this important, guys? Well, you get the passive losses from these things and you can offset your passive income. But if you're super smart, like how we work our taxes, we play the real estate professional status. There's a lot of nuances to that, which we talk about every other week in the mastermind group. You guys can learn more about that. It's passivecashflow.com slash journey. But you can do tricks like this. And you know, I'm sure people who've listened to the podcast a while know who I really don't like 1031 exchanges. I don't know why anybody does them who is a syndication investor. Because here's my tax form that I have displayed. This is on the cost seg website, simplepassivecashflow.com slash cost seg. So this year was, I think, 2017 or 18 when I sold seven of my single family home rentals that I had previously done a 1031 exchange. So I know what they're all about. I would never do one again, and I don't recommend it for most people. But I had a $200,000 capital gain, see here on line 13. But because I was doing all these syndication deals, doing cost segregations like Bill does, I was getting all these losses, and they're just piling up. So when I had this big capital gain, I just brought it over here on line 17 to knock it right out and no gain without a 1031 exchange. If you guys are thinking a 1031 exchange, please don't do it. Read this article. Please don't waste your money and don't be a sucker or distressed. We call them suckers, but they're distressed buyers. Whenever we want to sell an apartment, we, we, we jump for joy when there's a, a 1031 buyer because they are distressed buyers. But yeah, when, so come to this page. That's so the main thing we're talking about today is do it yourself cost egg. Bill also does regular cost eggs. He's looking at some of my apartments right now to do it the heavy duty way. But this is a pared down version. Absolutely. You want 1031s because 1031s for some people, generational wealth, handing it to the kids, what it was really designed for back in like the 30s or something like that. But people now use it. Oh, I just want to get rid of taxes. They you know, use it for the wrong reason. And there's so many, as you showed, a great example. You don't need a 1031 necessarily to reduce your taxes. So I'm not a fan of 1031s either. <laughs> There's a guy in those internet forums that always gets into like an argument on the internet forums so with me about 1031s. He's a 1031s. He sells 1031s. They always say, this is outrageous. You're like, 1031s are like the best. No, man. Like you're just looking at it in your small world. Like this is the bigger picture. Yeah. Maybe in that world, it, it is a, the best strategy that you know of, but I know something that's a little bit better. That's right. And and Joe Biden had said he's going at the first thing he'll be to go after is 1031s is a low hanging fruit. And I don't know if he's if that's just political talk or what politicians say anything to get elected. But he said 1031s show more risk than bonus depreciation at this point. So I, yeah. I We'll see what happens. Bonus depreciation. I don't think people understand like that you can depreciate an asset like with bonus depreciation. So therefore, it's out of the vernacular of the common American like APC can't. 
make an article on it, basically. Yeah. So yeah, let them have the tender one is what I say. Yeah. You know, should we actually say what bonus depreciation is? I don't think we defined that, did we? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And we also did mention a little bit that it is going to be going away in 2022, I think. Like it's stepping down 20% every year. So it's not going away entirely, but let's cross our finger. It gets renewed, right? Yeah, it, well, what's going to happen in 2022, and now it's 100%, and in 2023, it goes to 80%, and then it goes to 60%, and it goes to 40%. It's been 100% once before, and it's been 50% several times to infuse the economy. And so let's say you bought a property in 2020. You didn't realize cost seg, and you do it in 2021 and 2022. You will still, if we do cost seg in the future, do what we call look back study, you still get bonus depreciation because in the year that you paid for it, bonus depreciation was in effect. Or if you bought some in 2016, you go, Lane, you've introduced me to a whole new world. Oh my gosh, I bought this $5 million apartment complex in, in 2016. We can do a cost seg study on that now, get that lost opportunity in 2016, had 50% bonus depreciation. Of course, the key thing is all the five year, we're doing a catch up. You're going to get it all in year one. Anyway, so what bonus depreciation is besides the word, everybody knows, okay, we've heard about it. We've talked about 27 and a half year, 15 year, seven year, and five year. Seven years is your phone lines, but your short life, anything that has a shorter life than 20 years, you can depreciate in year one. It's an election on your software, your CPA software. You still put in your five, seven, and 15, but that bulk number, which might be 20, 25, or 35, or 45 percent, I've seen some multifamilies go to. You can take it all in year one. Doesn't mean you get extra. It just means you get it to take it in year one. So you get that big deduction like you got in your properties. So you offset that big capital gain. So now you're going to have to buy more properties next year to offset your other capital gain. So it just keeps going and you're going to keep building your portfolio and your wealth. So that's how it keeps working. It's I call well. the I call that the simple passive cash flow gravy train. Once you keep rolling and rolling and people always ask, don't you sell your properties and you got to pay back the depreciation and recapture and the capital gains? Yeah. But hopefully in the meantime, you went into dozens of deals and then you accumulate all these passive losses and you take that money that you did make and put it into two or three new deals. And keep the good times rolling. That's right. That's the other thing that people that I, that I don't like as well is recapture. Oh, recapture and like 1031s are all so great recapture so bad not necessarily because one we know tax rates are going up and especially capital gains rates so if capital gains rates go up to ordinary income rate then recapture you get recapture anyway on your straight line property so do you want to you're going to pay taxes on that money either in the future or today chances are your tax rates are lower today so recapture is not such a bad thing if you're using the money, if you're buying one house, you're sitting on it for years and you might sell them, buy another house. Yeah, it's probably to make sense. But if you're investing and churning your money, we have big clients. I won't say the names, but they do it on everything. They bought hotels in Hawaii. They're buying stuff all over the country, building and buying. They're opportunistic. They might sell it, but they're using that money. And the return they get on that money is greater than the tax rate they're paying. Capital. So again, it could be bad. Again, it depends on your situation, but recapture, and especially if ordinary income tax rates or cap gains go to ordinary income tax rates, it makes it a moot point. You're going to pay but, me now or pay me later. Put the money in your pocket today. But yeah, there, people are looking at this myopically. They're looking at one off deal, one property, and yeah, you do have to pay the depreciation recapture back. But I tell them like, hey, dude, look at the big picture. You better be in like 10, 20 deals, right? Like in the next five 10 years. Like you're not only in one, you're in multiple deals that are all kicking off these passive losses. So they all help like in the big picture of things. Right. You're going to pay tax on the recapture money anyway. So you could either pay them later in the future or pay them now or, or, or not pay them now. And that's what cost segregation does. It defers it. It's a tax deferral strategy. So anyway, what, what else? I love all I your pictures there, all, all the, the parties you've had or all the groups, masterminds and networking groups. Looks fun out there in Hawaii. Yeah, that's where you get all these strategies, right? It's not just like you're never going to read about this stuff in a book because this stuff changes so quickly, right? Like bonus depreciation is a rather new thing, but that's what I'm always preaching on. Develop your network, right? Most people, myself included, when I started out, the best thing was like listening to the senior worker in the cubicle. And that's absolutely not the guy to listen to for financial advice. Yeah, finding your peer group of pure passive accredited investors doing this stuff. And that's when you're going to find these little tips like this, just like the do-it-yourself cost seg, which yeah, again, check it out at simplepassivecashflow.com slash cost seg. Great 
for the smaller property that you may own in your portfolio. Okay, cool, Bill. Appreciate it. We'll talk a little bit later about some of the larger ones, largest cost segregations. But yeah, if people want to get a hold of you, you want to drop your contact info, or if not, they can reach out to me and I can connect you guys later on. Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's bill at elbcostseg.com. So ELB Cost Seg is our firm. Cost segregation. It's ELB Consulting, but the website ELB Cost Seg. So just bill at ELB Cost Seg. And my phone number is 480-747-5547. It is my cell, 480-747-5547. Perfect. And if you guys want to learn how to get these cost segregation bonus appreciation stuff, that's where the syndication deals come in. Get yourself educated. Pick up the e-course. Go to simplepassivecastle.com slash syndication to uh, check out the free guide there and uh, see if the e-course is for you. But we'll see everybody next time. All right, thank you very much. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.